Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this particular series is entitled, How to Interpret Scripture. And this is lesson number four in that series for April 25 of 2020, entitled, The Bible, the Authoritative Source of Our Theology. Hmm. The Authoritative Source of Our Theology. Well, as usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our loving Father, we have gathered here as a group of friends talking about you. May we understand what was prepared for us in these lessons and understand what you want to say to us uh, through them is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I suppose that sort of almost by definition, uh, a Christian church uses the scriptures to support their beliefs. Mm, not always, but yes. However, how, when, and how often these churches use scripture is not the same in all cases, obviously. What other influences might impact how people interpret scripture? Some of the most important sources of inf influence are tradition, experience, culture, reason, and the Bible itself. So let's have a look at some of those things and think about ways they might have influenced even some of us in our thinking. Um, when you read the Bible, how do you interpret it? Are there other factors that influence how you do that? What is your ultimate source? When it all comes down to where the rubber meets the road, as we sometimes say, what's really important? Do you really, what you t mom and dad taught you as a kid, is that more important than what the Bible says? We would probably be mistaken to suggest that anyone can interpret Scripture without being influenced at least partially by each of these sources. I mean, we're all creatures of tradition, culture, habit, experience. That's sort of the way things are. So let's, let's nail those things down the best we can. Let's start with tradition. Dennis, this what's tradition? This is uh, Merriam-Webster's Collegiate Dic Dictionary. An inherited, established, or customary pattern of thought, action, or behavior, such as a religious practice or social custom. Now, we have often referred to that in our groups as a paradigm, a way of thinking about things, okay? So tradition usually connects us with our roots, and, and that we all, I mean, look at the popular things on TV where people want to trace their ancestors way back to who knows where, and you're never quite sure how reliable those things are, but we, we, like, to, we like to know, it, it gives us a sense of belonging of, of here we are and look at these people that went up before us but there are some dangers associated with just accepting traditions without scrutinizing them a excellent example of that is found in mark 7 some pharisees and teachers of the law who had come from jerusalem gathered around jesus they noticed that some of his disciples were eating their food with hands that were ritually unclean what does that mean they had not washed them in the way the Pharisees said people should. For the Pharisees, as well as the rest of the Jews, followed the teaching they received from their ancestors. They do not eat unless they wash their hands in the proper way, nor do they eat anything that comes from the market unless they wash it first. And they follow many other rules which they have received, such as a proper way to wash cups, pots, copper bowls, and beds. Whoa, wash your beds? Hmm. I can tell you that nobody knows for sure exactly how they did this. In some places it talks about washing your hands up to the elbow and so forth. Uh, so we don't know exactly what this fancy, but the critical point is that this was not, well, we'll talk about that. Let, let me read the rest of the story. So the Pharisees and the teachers of the law asked Jesus, why is it that your disciples do not follow the teaching handed down by our ancestors, but instead eat with ritually unclean hands? Jesus answered them how right Isaiah was when he prophesied about you, 
You know, it seems like he's completely changed the subject, right? You are hypocrites, just as he wrote. These people, says God, honor me with their words, but their heart is really far away from me. It is no use for them to worship me because they teach human rules as though they were God's laws. You put aside God's command and obey human teachings. And Jesus continued, you have a clever way of rejecting God's law in order to uphold your own teaching. From Moses commanded, respect your father and mother, and whoever curses his father or his mother is to be put to death. But you teach that if a person has something that he could use to help his father and mother, but says, this is korban, which means it belongs to God, so what do you suppose that means, it belongs to God? It belongs to me. Well, the, Until I die. Well, it's yours to keep until you die, but when you die, guess where it goes? It goes to the temple. It goes to the mm -hmm. Pharisees and the Sadducees. He is excused from helping his father and mother. In this way, the teaching you pass on to others cancels out the word of God, and there are many other things like this that you do. Now, they did not have a social security system in those days like we have. And if you didn't support your parents, they were just out of luck. The Jews had a very typical but unusual way of washing their hands and arms when they returned from the market. While this behavior may have originally been for hygienic reasons, it came to have a very religious significance. It was regarded as very bad for people to eat what they, when they came from the market without washing in these particular ways first. In fact, the worry was that what came from the market might somehow have been contaminated by coming into contact with some Gentile. Gentile. Oh, dear me. In the days of Jesus, tradition had come to be regarded almost as equal to Scripture. In fact, in some cases, tradition superseded the teachings of Scripture. An obvious example was the practice of Korban, which we've just read about. However, on the other side, let's not look at just the negative. Tradition can be very helpful. Look at 1 Corinthians 11, 2. I praise you because you always remember me and my and follow, remember me and follow the teachings that I have handed on to you. So the teachings that I've handed on to you, those are the traditions, huh? And 2 Thessalonians 3, 6 is something similar. Our brothers and sisters, we command you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to keep away from all believers who are living a lazy life and who do not follow the instructions that we gave them. Those are sort of the traditions. So, Paul had passed on to several different church groups some of the traditions and customs that had grown to be accepted by Christian groups. In the early days, these traditions had such force that, in some cases, those who did not accept them were excluded from the Christian community. Hmm, is that a fair idea? Well, in the last few years, some authors have written books about how they tried to live a life or so, I'm sorry, live a year or so following the exact traditions of ancient Israel as written in the Bible. As you might imagine, that was in an attempt to make fun of the Bible. Traditions must be understood in the context in which they were followed. Yeah. If everybody else was living in the biblical way and you did that, it would seem perfectly normal. Yeah. Okay. Okay, do I dare to ask this question? Do we Seventh-day Adventists have any traditions? Yeah, we do. We certainly do. The way we conduct our Sabbath services come to be very much a tradition. You could go virtually anywhere in the world and they will follow usually more or less the same pattern through Sabbath school and church and so forth. Some places they have Sabbath school first. Some places they have church first and then Sabbath school. So there's a little bit of variation, but... It's pretty much the same. And what about the way we conduct our communion services? We're almost the only ones who do that anymore. Well, there are other traditions which are accepted in some parts of the world among Adventist groups, but not accepted in other areas. I had the interesting experience of spending three months in one summer between college and medical school working in a factory in Germany. And I got a little acquainted with the Adventist practice and so forth there in, in, in Europe. What part of Germany? And Ludwigshafen, uh, next to Mannheim, not too far from uh, Frankfurt, actually. Um, and then a few years later, I went, and of course, I'm 
from this part of the world, so I'm familiar with the Adventist customs here. Then we went and lived for three months, my wife and I, in the highlands of New Guinea. <laughs> and many what of the... What a difference. <laughs> you think there's a little difference? <laughs> well, there, most of the people who worked there, the, the missionaries there were from Australia and New Zealand, and the local people were, of course, Papuans, New Guineans, and things were a little different. I'm thinking, here we are, I'm, I'm, I'm juggling in my mind three different cultures, and some things that one group says, oh yeah, this is really a part of our tradition. Another group, Adventists. Oh no, we don't do that. Yeah. So we do have our traditions. Well, what, what role should experience play in our Christian lives? Another couple of verses. Look at Romans 2, 4. Or perhaps you despise his great kindness. Of course, it's talking about God. His, his great kindness, tolerance, and patience. Surely you know that God is kind because he's trying to lead you to repent. And Titus 3, 4, and 5, he saved us. It was not because of any good deeds that we ourselves had done, but because of his own mercy that he saved us through the Holy Spirit who gives us new birth and new, lo new life by washing us. And that washing, of course, refers to baptism. Paul goes on, if we had time, we could spend profitably some time in Romans 2. Paul, in Romans 2, you remember, in Romans 1, Paul, first of all, introduces this letter, this, and reduces himself, to a certain extent, to Rome. He has not been to Rome yet, so he's introducing himself to a new church where he's never been. And he talks a little bit about that, and then he starts off, he says, I know that some of you in the church in Rome, because the church had already been established in Rome, and I wonder... Uh, if you don't mind my taking a little detour here, is it possible that uh, the church in Rome could have been started by some of those soldiers who fell like dead men at the resurrection? Yeah. yeah. They went back to Rome. If they lived, if they survived. I don't know. That's just a little speculation. But anyway, so, he's in, and then, so then he says, I know that some of you came out of a tradition where, you know, things were really bad. I mean, and he just, one of the longest lists of sins in the whole Bible is in the last part of Romans 1. Then he comes to Romans 2 and he talks about his Jewish friends, the very conservative ones and all the things they're doing. And what does he say? Their dependence upon this very conservative approach makes them worse than the heathen. Mm makes them worth worse than the heathen. Wow. He couldn't possibly be talking about Seventh-day Adventists also, could he? Now, Gordon, you don't have to be so specific here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what about that? I'll read about it when you have time, Romans 2, 12 to 16. But experiences are a part of every human life. You, we, can't, we can't get away from experience. We cannot help but be influenced by our present, previous experience. Um, there's an issue that's very much boiling up in the church right now, and uh, I know a number of people who've, who are on one side of that, a number of people on the other side of it, and partly because they have relatives that are directly involved in either one side or the other side. So if you have a relative that is involved here, you tend to eh, lean that way a little bit. This is I mean, this is, we're human. That's, yeah. that's the kind of things we do. But well, sometimes the, the danger is that we go to one extreme or the other where we only rely on what we think it says here. Or on the other extreme, well, this seems to work, so why, what's wrong with it? Yeah. You know, uh, and so uh, there needs to be a feedback mechanism yeah. so that we're uh, examining both both issues because not everything like smoking you know mm -hmm. somebody who starts smoking says well it doesn't it's not bothering me mm -hmm. or a particular not until I find your lung cancer huh right even if it's cigars instead of uh, cigarettes, cigarettes. Yeah. yeah it is God's plan for us to be influenced day by day in our relationship with him through 
Bible study, prayer, and witnessing. Okay, those are the things we're supposed to be doing. Imagine how different Christian churches would be if each member studied his or her Bible, prayed and witnessed on a regular basis. What if you had a whole church doing that? And again, I will tell you, I have, my wife and, had one, wife and I had one of the most marvelous experiences our whole life. I uh, went to uh, Baltimore, Maryland, went to, took my M MPH, my Master's in Public Health at Johns Hopkins University. And while we were there, we joined a small church in the northern part of Baltimore in a place called Towson. And talking about witnessing a Bible study and so forth like that, they, that little church involved all the church members. They had five-day plans to stop smoking. People, and that, this was in the early days when, you know, people, well, that was really getting to be something, so it's, it was a little bit different <coughs> situation. But we had people on the waiting list to get into our five-day plans. And we did one every month. And there were exercise classes and, and cooking classes and so forth. And the membership of that church doubled in about nine months. Wow. It was just not, not all of them from outside. People came from other Adventist churches and they'd drive from further away because we had a lady that we actually picked her up. She was the wife of a pastor of another church. And she says, I don't, I don't plan to leave my church. I, I attend my church, but I just like to go to the church because so much is happening there. Hmm. I God mean, how many... God is on the move. What? God is on the move. Yeah, how many churches it's are like that? exciting. And just imagine it. Yeah. Well, God, God plans for us to enjoy beautiful relationships, beautiful art, music, thinks of all the wonderful things. I mean, the, the wonders of nature. God is, he especially wants us to appreciate the joy of his salvation and the powerful promises of his word. But each of us has experiences that could lead us away from God. And think about some experiences. Jackie, I think. Oh, 2 Corinthians 11, 1 to 4. I wish you would tolerate me even when I am a bit foolish. Please do. I am jealous for you, just as God is. You are like a pure virgin whom I have promised in marriage to one man only, Christ himself. I am afraid that your minds will be corrupted and that you will abandon your full and pure devotion to Christ, in the same way that Eve was deceived by the snake's clever lies. For you gladly tolerate anyone who comes to you and preaches a different Jesus not the one we preached, and you accept a spirit and a gospel completely different from the spirit and the gospel you receive from us. Well, Paul had planned for the Corinthian believers to remain faithful after he had worked so hard for them for a year and a half, but they had started to slip back into their old ways, and he warned them about what happened to Eve. Eve. Our world today is cluttered with influences intended to lead us away from God's plan for our lives. I mean, we have billion-dollar industries trying to figure ways to catch your attention for this reason or that reason. Our world today is, I'm sorry, but before we engage in any of these worldly experiences, we need to consider how they might relate to what's, what God's Word says. Okay, I'm going to read from Mark 12, 28 to 31. A teacher of the law was there who heard the discussion. He saw that Jesus had given the Sadducees a good answer, so he came to him with a question. Which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus replied, the most important one is this. Listen, Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second most important commandment is this. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. There is no other commandment more important than these two. Mm -hmm. That's from the Good News Bible. So how often do we think of God first when we are tempted to follow some worldly plans? How often do we think of loving our neighbors as we love ourselves? So now, let's move on to our next major category. What is culture? From the Webster's Collegiate Dictionary, 
the customary beliefs, social forms, and material traits of a racial, religious, or social group. Also, the characteristic features of everyday existence, such as diversions or a way of life, shared by people in a place or time. Okay? So every one of us is, has grown up in some kind of a culture. And it may be mixed. It may be relatively pure. I grew up in a place where I hardly have any, any contact with anybody except our local Adventist church. Yeah. And so I was contaminated or helped kept pure, whichever you want to call it that. So that's the way. People are different. Those habits, customs, and ways of thinking that we inherited from our parents and acquired from others when we were young often impact how we interpret all aspects of our later lives. So think of today, what's going on in our world. How many of our young people are being literally carried away from the church by cultural influences from their peer groups? Christian groups or churches have a specific culture. But in what ways do, should the Bible transcend established cultural categories of ethnicity or social status? Should we allow our cultural backgrounds to determine who we are willing to associate with at church? No. I can tell you that um, I just told you the story of the Towson Church, which is so wonderful. The very first Sabbath we were in Baltimore, we went to another church. And it was as white as you could possibly imagine. And we never went back there. As wide? White. White. Oh. Totally segregated. White in Baltimore. Huh? In Baltimore. Okay. And later, some of those people from that church said, well, how come you never came back? I said, well, we just spent four years in Africa working with Africans. and We're not... <laughs> we, we, we... To, to go back to a completely white church just didn't seem possible for us. So... Look at 1 John 2, verses 15 to 17. Do not love the world or anything that belongs to the world. If you love the world, you do not love the Father. Everything that belongs to the world, what the sinful self desires, what people see and want, everything in this world that people are so proud of, none of this comes from the Father. It all comes from the world. The world and everything in it that people desire is passing away. But those who do the will of God will live forever. So how often do we allow our love for certain things in the world to overrule what we know from Scripture? It may be necessary for a church that wants to grow and in order to keep its young people faithful to produce a counterculture, leading them away from the evil influences around them. So if they're going to be pulled in bad directions. What can we do to, to keep them, to pull them back in right directions? Ellen White from Councils to Parents, Teachers, and Students wrote, The followers of Christ are to be separate from the world in principles and interests, but they are not to isolate themselves from, from the world. The Savior mingled constantly with men, not to encourage them in anything that was not in accordance with God's will, but to uplift and ennoble them. <laughs> it's, it's funny how we have influences on people. I work with a, a lot of people at the clinic and because we require our, our junior staff to be bilingual, uh, many of them are not Seventh-day Adventists. But they know because they're associated with me all the time, they, they work through a while and they know that I'm vegetarian, that I do my regular exercise and all these healthful practices. So every time they see me coming, if they're doing something like eating a donut or something, <laughs> you know, people have been, you know, I just tease them about it. But, you know, you have an influence. So can you think of some cultural influences that are impacting you or your family that are in direct opposition to what the Bible teaches? TV and movies. TV and movies. How could you be so clear about that? So how should we react when we observe something like that taking place? Don't wow. get it in in the first place if you can. Avoid it. 
Uh, yeah. And the internet. Yeah. Brings all the same stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Getting worse. Well, the Bible has some interesting things to say about what should be pro top priority in our lives. Look at a couple of verses in Proverbs, for example. To have knowledge, you must first have reverence for the Lord. Stupid people have no respect for wisdom and refuse to learn. And a little further on in Proverbs 9, verse 10, it says, To be wise, you must first have reverence for the Lord. If you know the Holy One, you have understanding. Hmm. What do you suppose is implied by that? If you, if you know the Lord, you have understanding? There's a lot said in Proverbs about that. That's where I'm reading in my personal devotions. And this Good News Bible, Proverbs 7, is phenomenal yeah. in the word pictures that come up in the description of what's happening mm -hmm. as he looks out the window. <laughs> yeah. It's really good. God? Well, it, no, go it, yeah, it might... Um, I think of understanding as being experiential because mm -hmm. uh, you understand what something better when you go through it. And so this knowledge of the Holy One may not be necessarily just information, but yeah. experiential knowledge. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so as we taste and see that the Lord is good, we have an experience with God that then... Uh, yeah gives us greater understanding. John 17, 3, eternal yeah. life is to know the Father and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. Yeah. And exactly. that means incorporate everything you possibly can about so, it. I probably should let Gordon say this, but I mean, let's be honest. The only reason we have bodies and all the rest of this and the whole systems we have down here is to carry our brains around. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> And protect them and preserve them. I hear it all the time. You hear it all the time. I wonder why. <laughs> yeah, Gordon, if you don't know, is a neurologist. So, um, but, I mean, we can't avoid the fact God gave us brains and minds, and they're there for a specific function to learn, to, 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 to gather ideas, to hopefully use them in wise ways. Without a brain, no other part of the body would function. I unfortunately saw a very sad patient today, young lady, beautiful young woman, but involved in a terrible, terrible car accident. And she's really nothing more than a vegetable Aww. now. It's so sad. And her family cares for her, and they bring her in in her, you know, sort of stretched out wheelchair kind of thing. And... Uh, you know, we, you, 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 you grab onto her hand and she tries to resist you. And, you know, she obviously is, there's something working up there, but not much. Reflexes, huh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Really, really sad. sad. Mm. Well, God has given us the ability to think and to reason things out. So what role should reason play in our theology? Well, back in the 18th century, which came to be known as the Age of Enlightenment, uh, Th that age of enlightenment rose to a high position of influence in Western society. It suggested that reason alone, without any outward guidance, could ascertain truths and evaluate them. Ultimately, this meant that human reason was a test or norm for truth. Is that true? Well, the Adult uh, Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Wednesday, April 22, says, Everything that is not self-evident to human reason was discarded and its legitimacy questioned. This attitude affected large parts of Scripture. All miracles and supernatural acts of God, such as the bodily resurrection of Jesus, the virgin birth, or the six-day creation, to name a few, were no longer considered true or trustworthy. So if it didn't, if it didn't seem to be obvious how you could do that in that period of time or in a certain way, Oh, must not be true. Well, how much influence does sin have on our reasoning powers? It pervert it. One obvious right. example is the way in which drugs or alcohol, alcohol. impact our thinking. Yeah. People can do absolutely crazy things under the influence of certain substances, as, as you know. And unfortunately, I'm seeing that 
a certain segment of our population in this area now have almost come to a place where they think you, you shouldn't live without marijuana. It's really sad. Jim? Centuries ago, American President Thomas Jefferson made his own version of the New Testament by cutting out anything that, in his view, went against reason. Gone were almost all of the miracles of Jesus, including his resurrection. What should this, uh, this alone teach us about the limits of human res reason for understanding truth? Bible Study Guide, April 22nd. You want to say a couple words about that Jefferson Bible? <laughs> well, I, did you, I think I sent you a copy. I, of I, I didn't have time to, I looked a little bit, didn't have time to find okay. it. Well, it was, well I, I sent you an email of it with yeah. it in there. It, uh, the U.S. government printing office, there was a, about a 1901 or 1904 edition there, there but several people have, have reprinted it. But uh, he, there's a photocopy of or yeah. camera copy or whatever of, of what he did there. Yeah. But you'd end up with a kind of a thin, thin document. Yeah, right? yeah. that would be. Yeah. But and he was only interested in the Gospels. Yeah, he, was, he had no interest. It. Probably just the Gospels. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but reason can really be just rationalization because we like to think we do things for intelligent reasons but a yeah. psychologist told me we we usually do the, them for emotional reasons and then we use our intellect to justify them yes yeah and i mean you could imagine well that doesn't i don't see how he could have done that so toss it out so what about the bible what role should it play in guiding our religious thinking? The most important work of the Holy Spirit down to the centuries has been to give us the Bible. When we ask him to guide us in our thinking, he will always be in arrangement with the teachings, in agreement, I'm sorry, in agreement with the teachings of Scripture since he is the overarching author of the Scripture. How can we make the Bible our ultimate authority in all that we do and say? You have to be acquainted with it. Yeah. Exactly. Kerry? Yes, uh, I'm reading from John chapter 5, verses 46 to 47. If you had really believed Moses, you would have believed me, because he wrote about me. But since you do not believe what he wrote, how can you believe what I say? It's from the Good News Bible. Yeah. Um, how many people in Jesus' day do you think actually really believed Moses and then recognized that Jesus was a fulfillment of what Moses said before he died and before he was taken back to heaven? Think there were any of them? I think it's a little bit like now. We kind of tend to think that all those people that lived in Jesus' time all knew the scriptures. Yeah. I really doubt that that was true. There's people that are interested now and people that just don't have any bent toward spiritual thinking. Yeah. Hmm. Do you think that Nicodemus had this understanding when he visited Jesus, or as, did he come to that realization as he visited Jesus that evening in, in John? That's a early good question. John? I, obviously, he didn't understand the whole story. I mean, he, he, was, he was a part of that culture that did pay attention to Scripture. Yeah. He probably had his paradigm shifted rapidly during yeah. that meeting. Kind of a shake-up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Jesus made a very important point in this passage, as he does elsewhere. If we accept the truth as presented in the Old Testament, then we will also accept the truth as presented in the New Testament and in the life of Jesus. Since the author in both cases is the same, there should be no discrepancies, right? Mm-hmm. So Dr. Maxwell, my mentor, used to say, what's the relationship between the God who came down on Mount Sinai and the one who sat quietly on the Mount of Olives, or not Mount of Olives, I'm sorry, in the Mount of, of um, I don't know what they call that. Anyway, the, there's a, there's a amp, sort of a natural amphitheater where he gave the Sermon on the Mount. Yeah. And, um, you know, sat there with kids playing around and so forth like this, preaching that, that sermon. Same person, different audience. Yeah. 
little different behavior too. Well, <laughs> or, when, when you yeah, come, <laughs> when you come out of slavery and all you understand is force, he had to get their attention somehow. He certainly did. They were there with their noses in the dirt, scared to death. But a few days later, they were dancing around the yep. golden calf, drunk and naked, and forty, wow. and 40 days. Excuse me, forty years later, they were still pagans. Mm -hmm. They hadn't progressed a whole lot. However, there are people who have claimed to receive certain special revelations from the Holy Spirit. We have been told clearly that at the end of time, for example, Satan and his associates will convince the world <coughs> that Sunday is the correct day in which to worship. And that's found, read for yourself, Revelation 13, 3 and 4 and 7. Maybe we have a moment, let's look at that. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have been fatally wounded, but his wound had healed. The whole earth was amazed and followed the beast. Everyone worshipped the dragon because he had given his authority to the beast. They worshipped the beast also saying, who is like the beast? Who can fight against us? I mean, without going into the details of interpreting uh, Revelation, the whole world is going to be worshiping the devil. That's what it says. And it goes on there down verse 7 and 8. It was allowed to fight against God's people and to defeat them. And it was given authority over every tribe, nation, language, and race. All people living on earth will worship it except, fortunately, there are some exceptions. Those whose names are written before the creation of the world in the book of the living, which belongs to the Lamb that was killed. Wow. Wow. So how should we respond when you come across someone who claims to have been guided by the Spirit, but what they are teaching is in direct conflict with the Scriptures? I, maybe I can tell another story. Uh, many years ago, 1972, a group known as the Full Gospel Businessmen's Association in America <coughs> decided that they were going to systematically approach people from different churches and try to convince them that they needed to have the Spirit. They needed to speak in tongues and do that kind of stuff. And so that year was the year to convince Adventists. Mm. And they had a big gathering in the city of Boston. And uh, one of the professors from our college near there decided he would go down and see how this meeting would, 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 would go. So they went there, and pretty soon, it wasn't very long into the meeting, and people were standing up and, blah, 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 you know, this kind of, and then someone would jump up on the other side of the room and, give an interpretation, and then it would. So it went on like that for quite a while. Finally, this uh, professor got up and he gave a thing for quite a long time. And he sat down and someone on the other side of the room jumped up and said, oh, thank you, brother, for coming. Thank you, and this is what you have to say, da 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 And when the other guy stopped, it was all finished, the professor quietly stood up. He says, you know, he said, I'm a professor of biblical languages, and I just quoted Isaiah 53 from the original Hebrew, and I don't know to see what that has to do with what this <laughs> other guy just said over here. <laughs> and the whole place just went. <laughs> so, That's um, interesting. Yeah. So. And he never forgot that, I bet. Anyone that was there <laughs> no. have made an impression. Yeah. Well, think about the story of John and Peter in Acts 4. They were preaching in the, in, the, in the temple, so they were arrested, put in prison. And they got out. God, God, uh, God released them from prison. They went back to the temple next morning, very early, and they're preaching again. So the Sanhedrin gets together and they said, okay, we're ready to, be, to, to bring those people to judgment. Get them out of prison. Over here, we want to try them. Go to prison. Whoa, they're not here. Where are they? Oh, they're over there preaching in the temple. I, uh, you know, I, I, have to agree. I have to think that God has a great sense of humor. I mean, it's mm -hmm. not, nothing bad. It's not, but just makes you want to smile. Yeah. And, you know, what did, what did Peter and John say after they had been told, you shouldn't be dying. You told you to stop talking about this man. What are you doing over there? Well, and what was their response? You yourselves judge which is right in God's sight, to obey you or to obey God. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Wouldn't that be a safe question to ask of any experience? Mm -hmm. And this is Ellen White in Desire of Ages. Uh, Through the scriptures, the Holy Spirit speaks to the mind and impresses truth upon the heart. 
Thus he exposes error and expels it from the soul. It is by the Spirit of Truth working through the Word of God that Christ subdues his chosen people to himself. Wow. God has not given us the assignment of judging Scripture. We are not capable of safely picking out what we should follow and what not to follow. <clears throat> I think you could probably avoid following the story of the Levite and his concubine. Oh, yeah. but <laughs> God's word should, in fact, be our judge and guide each day. And, of course, there's a verse for that. If you give these instructions to the believers, this is 1 Timothy 4, 6. You will be a good servant of, Jesus, of Christ Jesus as you feed yourself spiritually on the words of faith <coughs> and of the true teaching which you have followed. And that's, of course, again, from our Good News Bible. So how should we respond to those who tell us they have received new light on some particular Christian belief? If it was our church's practice to accept every teaching brought in by some person suggesting that they have new light, soon our theology would be in total chaos. chaos. Mm -hmm. But scripture tells us to examine all things and hold fast to that which is good. This is from Council's yeah. on Sabbath School work, uh, page 28. Precious light is to shine forth from the word of God and let no one presume to dictate what shall or shall not be brought before the people in the messages of enlightenment that he shall send and so quench the spirit of God. Whatever may be his position of authority, no one has the right to shut away the light from the people. When a message comes in the name of the Lord to its people, no one may excuse himself from an investigation of its claims. No one can afford to stand back in an attitude of indifference and self-confidence and say, I know what is truth. I am satisfied with my position. I have set my stakes and I will not be moved away from my position, whatever may come. I will not listen to the messenger, message of this messenger, for I know that it cannot be truth. It is from pursuing this very course that the popular churches were left in partial darkness, and that is why the messages of heaven have not reached them. Wow. And I would like to say something that Jim has said in the past. We've talked about it sometimes. If you are worshiping exactly the same picture of God that you were worshiping a year ago, you are worshiping a graven image. That's idol worship, right? Well, if it's not changing. False, con false concept of God is, uh, is idolatry. Yeah. And uh, you need, need to be improving that picture every day. Learning Absolutely. more about God and improving the picture every day. We refer to the God as the infinite one. There should be no limit. Yeah. And we should always be expanding our understanding of the infinite one. To be honest, each of us must admit that tradition, experience, culture, and reason that we've been talking about and the Bible itself all impact us as we study and accept the Word of God in our lives. So which of these influences is the ultimate authority? Do we always accept the Bible as the ultimate authority? And this is from the Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for April 24. In one sense, culture, experience, reason, and even tradition in and of themselves might not of necessity be bad. They become problems when they contradict what Scripture teaches. Yeah. Absolutely. That's a good comment right there. Mm -hmm. That's the key point, yeah. when they contradict Scripture. That's the key thing on it. Jesus has given us the ultimate rule, love the Lord, love God first and our neighbors as ourselves. Why is it so hard to stick strictly to those guiding principles each day in our lives? I... I think about the guidance that Jesus gave us, love the sinner, but hate the sin. Yeah. And we are so prone to love the sin and hate the sinner. Do we allow the sources we have discussed in this lesson to guide us when, when interpreting the Bible? Is that always safe? Well, in what ways can we make sure that our churches exhibit a friendly, welcoming atmosphere and have social activities together that help to form a kind of culture that God will appreciate and bless. Particularly, our young people need to experience this kind of counterculture to guide them against the many other influences that impact them in the world. Sometimes it's very difficult even to admit to ourselves which of these sources of influence are impacting our thinking. It's very difficult to go against the traditions with which we have grown up. 
Some churches, like the Roman Catholic and Orthodox churches, allow tradition to play a decisive role in their practice and teachings. In other churches, such as the Pentecostal churches, experiences often serves as the final authority. For example, if you have not spoken in tongues during church, you are not regarded as a real church member. I had the experience of working with a group in a clinic some years ago, and most of the people in that, because I was just, I wasn't in any way responsible for that place, I was just working there. Most of the people who worked there were Pentecostals. And there was no question in their mind, if you haven't spoken in tongues, you're not a Christian. Hmm. You are not a Christian. In other situations, such as in liberal theology, human reason often serves as the last word in making decisions, decisions about what is true. And if you come along with something that doesn't fit with that, that doesn't make any sense. What kind of nonsense is that? You know, you can just hear them, right? But so what I want to know is, did you look back at them and say, because you speak in tongues and think that's right, you're not a Christian? I didn't, certainly didn't try to tell them that. Yeah, I was inclined to think that. Because, it is, because they have a culture, and there are many loving Christians mm -hmm. that love Jesus. And mm -hmm. so it's hard, it's hard to, anyway, it's, it, it's too it's, easy to judge. Yeah. It's hard to love the sinner and hate the sin. How can we tend to? Hate the sin and uh, stay away from the sinner. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he might influence us the wrong way. So how can we help others around us recognize which of these sources is operating as the ultimate and highest authority in matters of faith and practice? We cannot avoid the influence of tradition. It does not always need to be a bad influence, but we must beware lest tradition sets itself against the teachings of Scripture. In the churches of Galatia, in Galatia, Paul was forced to take a very strong stand against those who were trying to lead church members away from the gospel they had learned from Paul in the beginning. And this is from Galatians 1, verses 8 and 9, and it's from the Good News Bible. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel that is different from the one we preach to you, May he be condemned to hell. We have said it before and now say it again. If anyone preaches to you a gospel that is different from the one you accepted, may he be condemned to hell. How does he really feel about it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> kind of equivocal, I think. <laughs> yeah, well, he's writing... What kind of a mood was he in at that time? <laughs> yeah. He's writing this... No nonsense. Yeah, he's writing this at a time when Judaizers... Some of his former Pharisaical buddies were coming along behind him into these churches and say, Oh no, you can't be a real Christian. And they were they were trying to they were trying to convince people that they wanted people to be real Christians. Yeah. But in order to be a real Christian, you had to be you had to practice all the Jewish customs in addition to these nice Christian things too. Yeah. But you you know, you can't be a real Christian unless you're circumcised and da-da-da, da-da-da-da, da-da-da-da. Some of the other translations would have been like, be, be accursed or, uh, what's another one, uh, anathema. Yeah. Like a di different translator. The, 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 different. the Greek is anathema. Yeah. yeah. Well, each of us as faithful Christians is supposed to be an example, especially to the young in our churches. So you've probably heard the poem that says, you know, you're an example and people are watching you. It's, it's, it's easier to read you than it is to read some book that I don't really know about. I can see what you do. And if we're right examples, it impacts people. Second Corinthians 3, 2 and 3 from the Good News Bible gives us some counsel. You yourselves are the letter we have written on our hearts for everyone to know and read. It is clear that Christ himself wrote this letter and sent it by us. It is written, not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, and not on stone tablets, but on human hearts. 
So what was Paul saying there? In plain and simple language. We are. We may be the Bible that some people read. We That's represent right. the kingdom. We represent the yep. kingdom. That's exactly, and he's saying, we taught you the gospel, and, and, and you, we left you behind. We had to move on to other places, but you, you are the gospel that's, that's there in that city. You're, you're, the, you're the one that is supposed to be showing them the way to go. So, at least in principle, we accept the Bible as the ultimate source of authority. We need to recognize that it was given in a specific culture and at a specific time in history. We need to understand as far as possible the context in which each passage was given. And this is the opposite or the contrast to those people who are making fun of the Bible by living in the biblical way for a year here in this culture. Obviously, that was craziness. But on the other hand, we who read our Bibles... We know that there's, there were problems in the Old Testament. We're not trying to deny that. We know that people were slaves and they came out of slavery and all that kind of stuff that happened. But we need to understand those things in the context in which they happened. Also, mm -hmm. learn to read the Old Testament from what you learn in, from the Gospels. Mm -hmm. And there's some things you want, to leave, you want to put aside and not incorporate into your thinking. That doesn't mean you shouldn't know about it. But yeah. just because it's in the, in the Old Testament doesn't mean it's correct. But otherwise, if everything had been correct then, Jesus would not have needed to come mm -hmm. if the message was, 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 was clear. Yeah. Well, I'm, the, the scriptures say he had to come. Yeah, well, we just did. read that uh, in order well, to well, die. I understand that because the, the message was, had been corrupted. The Old Testament was, is co corrupted. But Jesus said... The scriptures had to be fulfilled. Well, I'm not arguing yeah. that. Uh, just, but I don't see how it would have. Uh, he well, could obviously, not have come. if you if you take the story way back to the beginning, if Adam and Eve had not sinned, well, yeah, well, it wouldn't yes, have been necessary. But, but yeah. a big change yeah. came yeah. further back. If Lucifer hadn't been <laughs> jealous there <you> go. of <laughs> Michael, <laughs> that wouldn't have. Yeah. We wouldn't have to deal with this whole thing. Something very junk. deep happened at, yeah. the, at the fall. And it, it wasn't just somebody got tricked yeah. into something. John 17, Jesus says, I've accomplished the work you gave me to do. I have made known your character. John 17, yeah. 4. Yeah. So uh, <coughs> obviously something had to be done, and he accomplished it, and he hadn't even died yet. And you mentioned the fact something big happened, something deep or whatever. You read in the Bible, Adam and Eve walked with God in the quiet of the evening. Mm -hmm. No problem. It was their best time of the day. It was a wonderful experience. We come down to Revelation and, or even in the days of Moses. Sorry, Moses, you can't see me or you will be consumed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sin will destroy those that continue to practice it. That's just, that's just the way it is. So what happens? From you can walk with God in the quiet of the evening to if you see God, you're consumed. Our will became corrupted. It's, it's not God who's changed. Right. No, it's us. We, we became, changed. We became corrupted so that resistance to his will would, would have killed us if we'd have been brought into his presence. Was there anything in, in the book of Genesis where uh, Adam and Eve uh, confessed that they, that they uh, did not... Uh, that they needed to have some new teaching. No, they just, it's very, it's very sketchy there. Yeah. No. Well, think of the impact that the Bible had on certain groups in the past. Think of the Waldenses and even the pilgrims that came to this country. How much influence does culture have on the way we worship God? From the adult teacher's Sabbath school Bible study guide, God created us with the ability to think much of the Bible calls us to reflect upon what is written in Scripture and stimulates our thoughts and thinking. The repeated question, what do you think? And there are multiple references there which you can get from our handout on theox.org or e this one even from the Bible study guide, teacher's guide. Uh, or related question, have you not read? And likewise, there are multiple references, mostly yeah. from Matthew. And, and, and let me just 
put a little meat on that story. I mean, these are people who, many of them, at least some of them, have probably <coughs> memorized all these passages from the Old Testament. And yet Jesus have to say, had to say to them, what are you thinking? Haven't you read? Oh, yeah, we memorized it. Well, okay, Gordon. So, continuing, have you not read implies that God wants us to use our minds in understanding him and his word. While we can understand God correctly and truthfully, we have to acknowledge that we will never fully comprehend everything about God. After all, we are created beings. We are not God. When reading the Bible, do we recognize that the Holy Spirit has guided each of us if it's of its authors? And what he did and said, I mean, just think of the different ways. I mean, from Jonah to, you know, to Paul, to Moses, to, wow. Jesus and the apostles repeatedly referred back to Scripture as normative in their teachings. And, of course, their Scripture was Old Testament. Old Testament. only the Old Testament. There was no New Testament written yet. We recognize that we need a reliable source of truth that goes deeper than what we feel is higher than what we think, and is more meaningful than any human traditional curse. Does the Bible have that kind of impact on our thinking? When we read the scriptures, is this, is this more important to us than what's in the news, what goes on at our jobs? You know, think of the way the, the, the world is going on, what's going on in the world around us. Thank God for his enduring and trustworthy words that we find in the Bible. And, and I have said this many times, but I'm going to say it again. We Seventh-day Adventists have not only all the Bible, but we have all the writings of Ellen White that help us to understand the Bible. There's no other group in the history that has had so much wonderful material available to them that have things spelled out as clear as possible to them. And here we are with all this stuff so readily available. I mean, I have all of it right here on my computer. What are we doing with it? And that's my question for you. Our kind and loving Father, we take these lessons very seriously. We know that there's a lot here for us to think about. We ask that you will come through to us. You will, you will communicate with us through your word every day on the, on the basis that you, what you want us to know is what we need to know and that your Holy Spirit will make it known to us if we just give him opportunity. May that be our experience every day this week and for the months to come is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.